took place in this way. So before we continue on in the story, I've just got to point out one small detail about this first verse. And it's simple. It's that when Matthew gives you the name Jesus Christ, he's giving you more than a name. When Matthew, or the New Testament, puts together the words Jesus and Christ, they're telling us more than Jesus' first and last name. And the reason for that is because Christ is not a last name. It's a title. Christ is a title, and it means Messiah. It means anointed one all, all throughout the Old Testament. It comes from the Hebrew word Mashiach, Messiah, Christ. And so we just have to notice that right off the bat, when Matthew says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way, he's saying the birth of the Messiah took place in this way. You can actually see it up above in verse 17. What does he say? He says, so all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Jesus is the Christ. Okay, so let's, let's keep reading. Now, the birth of Jesus, the Christ, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So Matthew sets the scene for us this morning. He sets the scene of two people, Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph are a couple, and they're betrothed, which is the ancient way of saying they're engaged. They are committed to one another. They are committed to marriage. And so their families are coming together. They're making the plans for the day. And Mary and Joseph are eager for the day the day when they come together in marriage, and that's precisely when things get a little messy, don't they? Matthew says that before they came together, before they consummated their marriage, Mary was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. So I know that many of us are familiar with this story, and so we know how it is, right? You know that Joseph is going to have a panic moment. He's going to assume, like we would all assume, that this is adultery. And the Lord's going to come to Joseph and say, hold on, wait. I'm doing something here. This is far more than you think. But for a moment, it's hard to do, but for a moment, I just want you to step into the story in real time. Think about what Joseph is feeling in this moment. Joseph is devastated. He's shocked. He's disappointed and grieved. I mean, imagine the emotions of the moment. Imagine the feelings that he feels when he hears that Mary is with child. Imagine the feelings of betrayal and anger and shame. He doesn't know what's happening yet. Even today in a world that values marriage way less than the ancient world or the biblical world, even today, this kind of circumstance of adultery would cause a lot of shame, a lot of disgrace. And so, what is Joseph's response? It's, it's the response of any commonsensical person. Verse 19, And her husband Joseph, being a just man, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. And so, What's not easy to see from the surface of things is that Joseph's response to Mary in this moment would have been absolutely shocking in the ancient world. In Joseph's day, according to Roman law, if, for example, a wife or a fiancé commits adultery against the husband, it was actually encouraged, that they would actually encourage the husband to publicly shame the wife, or vice versa. Now, why would they do that? Well, they would do that because if the husband doesn't take responsibility and put the 
put the supposed adulterer to shame, it might be assumed that maybe there's Maybe the husband himself is in on this adultery. Maybe he's some kind of prostitution leader, and he forced his wife into this situation. Unfortunately, that was a common practice in the ancient world. And so Roman law said, you need to divorce her, and you need to do it publicly. And so when we get to verse 19, and we read that Joseph was unwilling to put her to shame, And that he had resolved to divorce her, not loudly, but quietly. And we need to see what Matthew tells us. Joseph is a righteous man. Joseph is extending mercy, even in the midst of a situation where it seems like he's been sinned against. Joseph is a just man. Man, that's what Matthew says. That word just, it's the same Greek word for righteous. Joseph is a righteous man. And so why does Matthew want us to see that? Why does he point out that little detail? Well, he does so because as we're going to see throughout Matthew's gospel, Matthew sets up this theme for us. It's a very important theme. And the theme is centered on a question. Who is truly righteous? Who is truly a just person? Is it? A person like the Pharisee, who, yes, boasts outwardly that they are righteous, but inwardly they are unrighteous. Or is it the person who might not appear like much on the outside, but who inwardly is righteous, who trusts God? Jesus will say, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, You won't enter the kingdom of heaven. And so why is that important? It's important because Matthew right here is showing us Joseph is a righteous man. Joseph is a man like Jesus himself who extends mercy instead of judgment. That's what Jesus says. He tells the scribes and Pharisees, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Being a just man and unwilling to put Mary to shame, he resolved to divorce Mary quietly. In other words, he resolved to take the path of mercy. But as you know, the story doesn't end there. Look with me at verse 20. But as he considered these things, that is Joseph, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, Son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. In fact, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so question for you this morning, what in the world does it mean that Jesus arrives in the womb of Mary from the Holy Spirit? What does this mean? This is a question that's perplexed not just believers, but unbelievers for thousands of years. In fact, some people won't believe Christianity because they think this is impossible. How is it possible for God to become a man in the womb of Mary? At the same time, you know this as a church because we confess the Nicene Creed every Month At the same time, the church has just boldly confessed, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ who came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. And so the question is, how is that possible? And if you're looking for a literal, detailed answer to that question, I just want to warn you this morning, you're going to be looking for a very, very, very long time. Matthew does not give us an explanation for how this happened. But he just says, it's, it's a very general statement. He just says, the birth of Jesus Christ came about in this way. It's one of the reasons why you can trust the gospel, specifically Matthew's gospel. In myths of the ancient day, there was all this elaborate prose and this preamble about the gods and, and, and humans coming together. 
And in Matthew's gospel, it's just real life. The birth of Jesus Christ came about in this way. That's it. And so what's that tell us? What's that tell us about this moment? It tells us that Matthew 1, the incarnation, is not a, it's not a problem to be solved, but a mystery to be received. It is not a scientific problem to be solved and to figure out. It is a mystery to be received this morning. That's what we're doing when we confess the Nicene Creed. We're not explaining the incarnation. We are glorying in it. We are holding it with the empty hands of faith. And so just as a side note for evangelism, for when you're sharing the gospel with people, if anyone ever critiques you and critiques Christianity and says, you Christians just can't handle any mystery, can you? You're always trying to explain things. Your response can be something like this. No, friend, we love mystery. We embrace the mystery. The reason why we use precise theological language to talk about the incarnation is because we want to hold the mystery tightly. Joseph does just that in this story. He holds the mystery with the hands of faith. Verse 24, jump ahead with me a little bit. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she'd given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Joseph embraces the mystery. He embraces the proclamation that this child is from God. It's from the Holy Spirit. And he obeys, doesn't he? The angel says, you shall call his name Jesus. And that's exactly what Joseph and Mary do. And he called his name Jesus. So what is happening here? What's happening here? The angel is not giving Joseph an explanation for how the incarnation is possible, how God can become a man. He is telling Joseph why God is becoming a man. And why is that? To save you from your sins. You should call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from his sins. Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua. Yeshua means the Lord saves. So the angel says, Joseph, your, the, the child in your fiancé's womb is not, is not the result of adultery. It's the result of God at work. He is God from God, from the Holy Spirit. His name is Jesus. You must name him Jesus because the name reveals the person. And the person saves. Jesus means the Lord saves. And so this is the why behind the incarnation. The creed says, doesn't it? For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. When we know that, we know the reason for why Jesus came. How he came, how this is possible becomes a little less important when you understand why this happened. And so notice, how does, Jesus, how does Joseph receive this news? How does Joseph receive this news? He receives the news by faith. He trusts God. Of course, Joseph is probably complex. He's probably, I mean, imagine that you're engaged and your fiance is, is with child and she tells you this is from God. Like that would be a hard one to grasp, right? I think for any of us. And yet, despite the difficulty of grasping this mystery, he, he holds it. Look at me at verse 22. Matthew adds a little, a little more detail to the story. Another reason why this took place. 
Verse 22. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had already spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. How many of you this morning have ever seen the movie Interstellar? Okay, great movie. One of the best movies of all time. And you know what to do this afternoon if you haven't seen it. I love the movie Interstellar. Christopher Nolan, Matthew McConaughey. That's not the reason I love the movie. The actors are great. I love the movie mostly because of the music of the movie. If you've watched the movie before, you know that there's this building song all throughout the movie. There's this rising song throughout the movie. And you might even remember how it goes. It just keeps building and building and building. Okay, so why do I bring up Heather Seller? Why am I bringing up this music? I want to bring this up because Matthew's gospel, especially Matthew chapter 1, is like a song that is rising and rising. The first note he lays down, Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. He is the Christ. Now, the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. The first note is added. And then Matthew adds another note. Jesus comes into the world not as a result of man's work, but the result of the Holy Spirit. Another note in the song is added. Dun, dun, dun. And then another. We learn that Jesus has come to save his people from their sins. The why of the incarnation. Why did he come to save you and me? Another note to this rising song is added. And then Matthew brings this, this choir to its climax. Verse 23, he says that this long-awaited Messiah, this child from the Holy Spirit who's come to save his people from their sins, is God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. This is the heart of the Christmas story. This is the heart of the incarnation. The most amazing thing about this story. God in the form of a tiny baby being knit together in his mother's womb. Waiting to take his first breath on earth. God clothed in flesh that will get dirty and messy and tired. And as he's a baby, probably have spit up all over himself. But ultimately, this is flesh that will get nailed to a cross. This is what God with us means. Salvation for sinners. And it's at the heart of the mystery that is the Christian faith. Thousands of sermons have been preached. Thousands of books have been written, all to try to grasp this mystery, and still it ought to astound us. It ought to astound us. And the question is, what are we supposed to do with all of this? What is the point of this text? Why do we return to the Christmas story year after year after year as a church all across the world? The church rehearses this story. Why? Why? I want to give you two reasons. This will conclude our time together. I want to give you two reasons for why we as Christians must not lose our awe at the story of Christmas. The story of God with us. First reason. The story of Christmas, the incarnation, is part of the story that God uses to save sinners. Patrick reminded us of this last week. Unbeknownst to us, for whatever reasons, when we share this story with others, this is the thing that awakens faith in people. This is the story that God uses again and again and again to draw people to himself. 
And so we rehearse it year after year because we want it ingrained in us as Christians, don't we? We want this moment in the gospel story to be so ingrained in us so that when we come across someone who is far from God, we can tell them how God has drawn near. This is the heart of the gospel story. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. And the word of Christ includes... Mary, you're going to have a baby. He's going to save his people from their sins. And and more than that, he is going to be God with us. So we rehearse the story because it is the story that God uses to save sinners. Second reason. We rehearse the story of the incarnation because as we reflect on it, and this is hard in a modern distracted age, but when we slow down during this, we have a whole month to do it. When we slow down during this season of Advent, it takes us deeper and deeper into the mystery of God's grace. The incarnation is what reminds us that God became a baby. The incarnation is what reminds us that when God came to us, he did not do it in a display of almighty strength, but he did it in a display of amazing weakness. God as a baby. This runs against all our notions of what God is like or what God would possibly do for the world, doesn't it? Think about the religions of the world, contrary to the deist, who says that God is far away. The incarnation tells us God is near. God is with us. Contrary to Islam, God is not an angry judge causing you to to fear him and to and to stack up enough good works to please him so that you can be saved. No, the incarnation tells us that God is a father who comes to his children and invites them into salvation through his son. Contrary to the many, many gods of Hinduism, God is one. And the incarnation tells us that God is not subject to to idols made by the human mind. He declares who he is. He does whatever he pleases. And he invites us in on the fun. I say fun just as an aside because G.K. Chesterton and C.S. Lewis, J.R. Tolkien, if you know those names, Christmas for them was the most joyful time of the year. And they, they, they say over and over again in their writings, um, I love this, they, they say Christmas should be filled with mirth, which is the old word for joy. Yes, we, we experience the fallenness of this world, but when we, when we take time to reflect together as a church and individually in prayer and in reading of scripture and in reflection, to fill us with joy that God is inviting us into this story. So, All of that to say, the incarnation or Christmas is the story that God uses to save sinners. And Christmas is the story that takes us deeper and deeper into the heart of God's grace. The more we reflect on it, the more we are astounded that God would do this for us. Now, before we close, we're almost done. Before we close, I want to speak to the person in the room who perhaps feels a bit distant from all of this, this Christmas season. Perhaps you feel as if Christmas is nothing more than a thing of the past, as as if it's something that happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, and so you feel distant from it. You feel distant from the story, which means you feel distant from Christ. So if that's you, then let me remind you this morning. Let me remind you. The incarnation of Jesus 
is not only the fulfillment of an old story, it is the beginning of a new story. The incarnation is not only the fulfillment of an old story, one and done, it is the beginning of an entirely new story, which means that yes, this story happened 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. But it is a story, it's the same story that is continuing on right here and now in Kansas City, Missouri. So if you feel distant this morning, if you feel like there's a barrier between you and this story, between you and Christ, then let me remind you, as Patrick said last week, you are part of this story. This story is your story. One theologian even goes so far as to say that every conversion is a virgin birth. Every conversion is a virgin birth. Now, why would he say that? He says it. Think about it. Every conversion, every person who comes to Christ comes to Christ because the Holy Spirit comes to them, enters into the womb of their lives, and gives birth to Christ. And they are born again. This is what Jesus says. You must be born again. And how is it? By the Holy Spirit. Every conversion is, in some sense, a virgin birth. It is something new that God does in us. Paul says, my little children, I'm in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. So the story is happening all of the time. This story is your story. This story is our story. And so if you are discouraged this morning, take heart. If you're weary this morning by your sin and the suffering of the world, take heart. If Christ feels dif- distant from you, take heart. Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. And I think to show us why that is so important, Matthew ends his gospel by essentially saying the same thing. What does Jesus say in the last sentence of Matthew's gospel? It opens, Emmanuel, God is with us, and how does it end? Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you, and behold, I am with you, even to the end of the age. It's their story, and it's our story, friends. Emmanuel, God is with us. Let's pray.